hungry just now, but after listening to uh, Justice Joseph, you know, I am reminded of the uh, Tirukkural, uh, and uh, also a saying in Tamil which says, "Sevikku una illa the kodi siri dada ko bhaiya trikum iya padu." It means when you don't have enough of you know information from the ears, then only you need to eat a little bit for your stomach. So today. In fact, the food that we had to take has all come from Justice Joseph since we have got it through the years and our stomach is also full for some more time, I guess. So let me take you, uh, you know, with permission. <laughs> Sir, it was actually an in-depth knowledge on all the five cases. In fact, it brought out a lot of uh, uh, illusion and also the wrong notions about certain concepts which we had. We all think when we take up a case, that we have read about it and then we proceed on a particular direction. But it reminds me, Justice Joseph's uh, you know, lecture reminds me, of course, of my own local age days, like David put it very beautifully. I am saying that whenever you take up something, we should presume, like my senior would say in Coimbatore, you must always presume that the person who is listening to the case, the judge, sir, sorry to say it's not meant to offend or anything, that they do not know anything about the provisions or the substance in the case so that you should start pleading and explaining everything when you prepare that the person who is listening to you will not know anything. Only then you will be able to get a clarity on the subject and you can prepare about it. So therefore, whenever we get a case in Supreme Court, we think whatever is pleaded in the basic plea, pleading of course it's the plaint and the written statement of the Magna Carta they, as they would say of a litigation. But whenever we get a case, we should actually look into the provisions which are relevant for preparing the case and then see what, you know, what has been left out while being argued in the courts below. We need not confine ourselves to the basic, uh, the question of law which has been traced before the courts below and we can always find some place how to bring it in the larger aspect of law into the facts which are brought before the court and try and see whether we can improve it to our best only with the help of the knowledge of basic provisions. Today, Justice Joseph has taken us to the enactments when he is taking us, taking us through the five important landmark judgments along with the relevant cases to be read when you are reading these cases for the examination. Which is precisely what one of my aims also to come here is to tell you what an examiner expects when he is correcting all your reading cases paper. First of all, let me tell you, reading cases paper if you do well, I mean, if you prepare well on all these 64 cases which have been handed out to you, you can do a lot better in your other three papers also. Like in practice and procedure or in ethics or in the uh, uh, paper of dra uh, drafting also. The questions which are asked will be basically legally and uh, some on decided cases. So if you know the pleadings and the provisions and the grounds which have been taken and the contentions which are made before the court, it will be much easier and simpler for us to prepare for the other three papers. So, leading cases paper will be the sheet anchor and the basis on which you will be preparing. I am sure all of you have already prepared because there is hardly any time, you know, December 19th I think your papers are starting. So, I think if you have not done so, you can just have a quick look on all these cases. And the second thing which I am trying to do today is to bunch a few cases and tell you about a particular bunch of judgments. There are 64 cases given to you in this list in which, like my Lord uh, Justice Joseph has told you, that if you take up a particular topic, say basic structure in case one in the Bharati's case, if you are asked to read that case and if a question comes, it will not be directly on the subject of basic structure and case one in the Bharati at all. It will be one of the aspects of basic structure, the question will be asked to you. And you may have to explain from the theory of basic structure whether it will amount to a part of basic structure, whether these angles have been considered in which of the judgments and two of them or three of them may be in the list of 64 as well. Like for example, that comes to my mind immediately is I would say, uh, Justice Joseph was also saying, now the courts have started legislating, courts have started judicial legislating, wherever there is a vacuum, wherever there is a legislation. In fact, the judgment which my lords have just said in the beginning itself is one of that, is that uh, uh, about uh, judicial legislation. 
here, in fact, the uh, Gita Harikar in itself, the court went behind the literal interpretation and started saying that after can be interpreted in a different manner. Likewise, I would say, if you say, if you start with the sexual harassment case of Vishaka, in that, what had happened was an NGO worker had gone to a village to preach certain aspects of how to treat them, how to treat women, how to abolish child marriages, all that. But the villages therein did not like it and there was a gang rape and that case was brought, the criminal case apart. I am talking about the aspect which came up before the Supreme Court in that was about the sexual harassment that is caused, the harassment that has been meted out to the person, the lady who had gone on work. So the Supreme Court took upon itself to examine various conventions, CEDA, that is crime and all uh, elimination of all forms of discrimination against women with, since India is a signatory and that on that basis and also for honoring international conventions like we have article 51 and other uh, constitution angle also giving that and also united nations conventions this court said yes there is no particular legislation of course we have criminal law aspects to punish a certain person to prosecute him but the angle as far as the uh, the harassment part in the workplace is concerned we don't have a particular legislation so therefore there was a series of guidelines which was given out in private as well as public workplaces as to how the employer should follow these steps till a proper legislation finds its way. In fact, this judgment was 1997 and the first legislation was 2013 that we got in this, the Sexual Harassment Act, Prevention of uh, Sexual Harassment in Workplaces. Now, in that angle, if a question is asked about the judicial legislation, I would say you can go to Shakti Vahini as well. This Shakti Vahini is also given to you in the list of 64 cases. Vishaka is also given to you. Vishaka is 97, 6 SCC 241. You can say in fact paragraphs which I would ask you to go through is 16, 18, 17 is the guidelines. It starts, it talks about legislation of article 253 as well for giving effect to international agreements. It, brought, it brings it to the constitutional court and then takes it upon itself to decide because there is no legislation, the court doesn't shy away from doing this. It says it is most important and gives in this paragraph 17 the guidelines. Likewise, if you go to Shakti Vahini, which is 2018-7 SCC 192, this follows Vishaka guidelines. This was a <coughs> case where preventive steps were to take to combat honor crimes to submit a national plan of action and state plan of action. It was a writ petition under 32, seeking directions to the state governments and the central government to take preventive steps to combat honor crimes. Now, these days we come across a lot of honor crimes forming cup panchayats in villages and they keep taking a call about a particular uh, a lady marrying out of caste or a lady becoming pregnant without getting married, inter-caste marriages and pregnancy, infidelity and unapproved relationships refusing an unarranged marriage, demanding custody of a child after divorce by a woman. All these were looked down upon by these cup panchayats and honor killing keeps taking place. Therefore, this repetition was filed by an NGO called Shakti Vahini. They sought protection from this honorable court under Article 32, seeking such directions as to how the states are planning to combat these kind of crimes. We have IPC provisions, we have several other provisions as well. But these are certain crimes which have now found a place and more often we come across these in remote villages, rural areas as well, which have no, there are no specific provisions to combat these kind of situations. So therefore, certain directives, the affidavits and etc. are called for from the states and the arguments faced by these Kap Panchayat unions, they all, when they come up to say we are only spreading information, we want to protect the honour, we want to protect our culture, is all vetoed and this honourable court said that these are all not constitutionally valid and it invades in the privacy of people, the autonomy of a person to choose a partner and therefore come, this court cannot hesitate to get into the, uh, the uh, give it the, all these legislative, and will, I mean take up the issue of giving directions to various states and the central government to follow certain procedures when these kind of crimes occur. This, in fact, they relied upon Lakshmi Khan Pandey of 1984 to SEC 244 and Vishaka. 
So these were relied on by the Supreme Court to say preventive steps. What preventive steps can these state governments take? What remedial measures they can take? And what punitive steps that they should undertake? So these are a bunch of cases. In fact, I would go a step further in bunching D.K. Basu's case as well along with this. You all have been given D.K. Basu versus State of West Bengal, 97, 1 SEC, 416. We have, of course, we have uh, Lalita Kumari thereafter, but this is about following procedures during arrest, interrogation, and also creating awareness and to grant compensation in a case where there is a arrest which is illegal, detention which is illegal, and interrogation without the presence of a lawyer, etc. This is D.K. Basu's case. In fact, this case was initiated by the executive chairman of Legal Aid Services West Bengal. It's a non-political organization registered under the Society's Registration Act. They addressed a letter to the Chief Justice of India then, seeking their attention to certain news items published in newspapers regarding deaths in police lockups and custody. So he says he requested that it's imperative to examine the issue in depth and to develop custody jurisprudence in India and formulate modalities for tackling the issue. So thereafter, this issue was taken and dealt with by the Supreme Court. It dealt with the Article 14, 19 and 21 together and examined the powers of arrest and the method of arresting a person and also it gave guidelines as to what kind of method will have to be used while arresting a person and during interrogation, what is the method which will have to be adopted? This is in fact dealt with in paragraph 17, 13 to 16 are in fact relying upon certain international reports and as to methods of how they are using and how the object has to be served by not merely using preventive measure but also taking certain positive steps in that angle. Whereas 17 and 18 deal with the fundamental rights aspect of, I mean, uh, how these uh, the newspapers convey such disturbing news and how it affects and invades into the fundamental rights of the citizens. They relied upon the Joginder Kumar case and Neelabati Behera in which a state action was compensated when the state inaction was sought to be compensated by the Supreme Court and they took it upon themselves to issue certain directions. Para 35 issues requirements to be followed. You may please go through para 34 and 35 as to the procedure you know, which is to be followed, which is given out in detail. The court says, ubi just ibi remedium. Wherever there is a wrong, there is a remedy. Principle is followed. And therefore, they also say not only the procedure to be followed and wherever there is a wrong which has been found and brought to light, compensation will have to ensue. So the grant of compensation angle is also dealt with in para 45, point 40, uh, 54 as well. So I would request you to bunch the aspect of court legislating and whether the court could go into areas of such nature. If there is a question in that direction, you can take up DK Basu, Vishaka, and the next case of Shakti Vahini together and then deal with this angle. See, in while you are answering a question, and aside I'm saying, in your, when a question is asked, please don't say the answers in a bullet point. You please tell the examiner that you have done the paper, you have studied the paper and you know little bit of everything, the case that relied upon. So therefore, you must give a little of the background of the case. Justice Joseph had given you a broad angle about even the provisions involved, not only in the case, in the entire enactment, so that it gives you a broader outlook as to how to approach a problem when you are reading the case. It's always better, you know, when you read, I realized, when you read a judgment fully, it never goes out of your mind. Whenever you have a case somewhere similar, it will come to your mind. You, so we may say that we don't remember all these judgments, page numbers, paragraphs. Yes, page numbers, paragraphs, you don't have to remember. But please, you will definitely remember a judgment after 50 years also. If you really read the judgment in full, after understanding the provisions and what is held there in full, at least once if you read it, you can never forget it and you can actually correlate it with several other angles and several other judgments. So this is how I would like you to uh, uh, I mean, concentrate on angles when you group the 64 cases. In fact, 
sitting with my office colleagues, we tried to group a lot of cases in this group of 64. We came upon a lot of groups in this. I can say if you have something about tribunalization and uh, Article 323 and is asked, we may go to first case in the list is Chandra Kumar. Then you can talk about Roger Matthew, how the judgment, judges are appointed to the tribunals and Madras Bar Association, how it affects the independence of judiciary. All these angles are together dealt with whether the tribunalization is helpful or whether the tribunalization has affected the, uh, the dispensation of justice, whether, how far the cases have succeeded, how far the dispo disposal have taken place, whether there is a judicial angle which has come to it, those sort of general questions you may have to approach by dealing with a bunch of cases and not merely one judgment, which will also give you a broader output. I would say bunch them together, Chandra Kumar, Madras Bar Association and Roger Matthew, please do that. And when you talk about reservation, you may have to go first to Indra Sahani's case is also in your list and then couple it, follow it up with Jarnail Singh, which has been rendered recently. So please bunch these. When you are preparing for the examination, if you bunch and put a table, you will probably end up acquiring the knowledge quickly. And the first judgment, when you read it, the second and the third may not be that difficult. You will be, it's only a following up of the first one and what has been latest, you know, change in the, uh, the dispensation. So you can say like, you're talking about unaided institutions, right to admit, right to carry on, uh, profession, freedom of profession, freedom of trade. Then you have the list of TMFI and Inamdar. What has been held, whether they have a right to run, in, uh, run their own institutions, whether there is a difference between minority, unaided, unaided, major, I mean, unaided and aided minority, and also unaided private colleges and schools. Those angles you will have to separately tackle them. Now, what we have done, we saw, uh, we, I thought of telling you about Pramati. Pramati judgment is about right to education, which is reported in 2014, 8 SEC, page number 1. This is a constitution bench of five judges. This is a reference made by a three judges bench of this court. After the case of society for unaided private schools was decided. In fact, the question was about whether the validity of Article 15.5 and that is introduction of Article 21A in the Constitution, whether it is valid or not. This judgment dealt with two issues. That is whether the Constitution 93rd Amendment Act, which amends Article 15 by inserting Clause 5, alters the basic structure or framework of the Constitution and is therefore illegal, invalid and unconstitutional. Number two, whether the Constitution 86th Amendment, which inserts Article 21A into the Constitution, alters the basic structure of the Constitution and hence it is invalid and unconstitutional. See, both have been upheld. The arguments were in fact were manifold about basic structure and also it says that it brings up the, and in fact there was one of the argument was that you can't distinguish the minority because society for aided, uh, unaided private schools had said about minority institutions were also. So therefore, this judgment also raised, the contentions were also raised about whether the minority schools could be excluded from the purview of this amendment because it predominantly applies to all private institutions and when there is a restriction that comes to freedom which are granted in the part 3 or even the minority institutions can also be restricted by these restrictions was one of the arguments which were raised. Apart from the other arguments, they say, the, uh, they say they, it disturbs the integrity of the nation by encouraging this divisive facets of linguism and commun communalism and it is highly injurious to national unity and integrity. They are saying imparting education is that of the state and the centre and it is not about the private institutions which are trying to do their own business and they have the freedom to do that. So therefore, the state's job cannot be pushed over to the private institutions. But this court dealt with all these contentions and came to the conclusion that article, these two, they don't violate the basic structure. It held like this, the constitutional validity of 15.5 in so far as it enables the state 
to make special provisions relating to admission to educational institutions of the state and educational institutions aided by the state was considered by a constitution bench of Ashoka Kumar Thakur and the constitution bench held in the opposed case 15.5 is valid and does not violate the basic structure of the constitution so far as it relates to the state maintained institutions and aided educational institutions. However, the constitution bench in that case had left open the question whether 15.5 was constitutionally valid or not so far as private unaided educational institutions are concerned. So, we have one judgment of Ashoka Kumar Thakur which had to be read along with this and then it talks about the next aspect of private unaided education institutions were not before the court. This batch of writ petitions have been filed by private unaided education institutions and we are called upon to decide. It says article 21a provides that the state shall provide free and compulsory education to all children of the age of 6 to 14 years in such manner as the state may by law determine. Parliament has made the law contemplated by Article 21A by enacting the right of children to free and compulsory education act 2009. The constitutional validity has been considered in society for unaided private schools which is 2012 6 SCC page 1. The two of the three judges have held 2000, uh, 2009 act to be constitutionally valid but they have also held 2009 act is not applicable to unaided minority schools protected under 31 of the constitution. This aspect has been dealt with and this court says the state can perform its functions even through these educational institutions and there is nothing wrong in providing this uh, directing and making the provisions like provision of EWS category in every, in every education institution which is private unaided schools except the minority institutions is what the judgment held finally. It said all the judgments above has been followed and finally they said para 28 we do not find any merit in the submission of the council for petitioners that the identity of the right of unaided private education institutions under 191g of the constitution has been destroyed by 155 of the constitution moreover the contention that excellence will be compromised by admission from amongst the backward class of citizens and the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribe in private education institutions is contrary to our preamble of the constitution which promises to secure to all citizens fraternity assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity and integrity of the nation. It expanded the scope and then said it is not about the uh, just by giving the 25 percent of economically weaker sections to in your education institutions it does not destroy your, uh, your privacy your uh, right to do your I mean carry on your freedom of trade and business so therefore they say this article is valid and constitutional and 21a it says right to education it, it provides that state shall provide free and compulsory education accordingly 2009 act was enacted by parliament to provide free and compulsory education to all children of age of 6 to 14 the validity is challenged and considered by the earlier judgment but if we have noticed what it says at para 49 is that the state shall provide for these children of 6 to 14 years may the state can only mean state can make the law is what it is interpreted how so therefore the argument that it is only the state which can run the, these kind of institutions and don't force the private institutions to take economically weaker section is incorrect because state by its own mechanism has enacted this law in their own powers so therefore the, even the private unaided institutions are supposed to maintain that and follow the directives issued by the state except it will impinge upon the rights of minorities so there is a separate right that they have got under the constitution and article 30 so therefore except these minority institutions all of them the private unaided institutions will come under the purview of this so the conclusion is that the constitution 93rd amendment act 2005 inserting article 15 5 of the constitution and 86th Amendment Act 2002 inserting 21A of the Constitution do not alter the basic structure or framework of the Constitution and they are valid. Right of children to free and compulsory education act is not ultra-virus article 19 g 2009 act in so far as it applies to minority schools aided or unaided covered under clause 31 is ultra-virus the Constitution. So only to that limited aspect. So, if a question is asked about these aided, unaided schools and the right of the state to control them, you will not only write about 
pramati you will have to know about the earlier judgments which are dealt with in pramati about the society so when an answer is given an all inclusive answer you don't have to touch para to para you have to broadly give an idea about the background on which this case was brought up the, the major contentions which you came across and then the finding final finding what the supreme court held at least the examiner will know that you have studied the case and you know what is the ratio in that matter so it is all that matters is the ratio which should be understood by the student it's not only for the aor examinations let me tell you when i prepared for the aor examinations i was being very lazy and it was very difficult with all the domestic chores and the professional uh, front also but uh, once i studied and wrote the examination subsequent years of practice i have really realized that it has helped me to a great extent to understand how to prepare and argue in a court of law also uh, what sort of contentions can be raised what were raised in fact some of them now we have youtube now we have whatsapp videos to see what has been argued what is being argued in a constitution bench we can also read these statements those days the accessibility was also a little bad now we have on the touch of a button we have all the judgments so it's very easy to do a research and get it done 25 <coughs> years ago it was not so easy so i feel that studying these cases from the book or from the computer but please study them fully it will not only for the it will not only helpful for the aor examination but it will uh, enhance your general skills of practice and you become a better advocate after this is what i personally feel now the next one in this i if you are not uh, uh, in a hurry to go i can probably tell you about uh, two three uh, uh, cases and uh, i will wind it up see uh, the thing which we were uh, saying about uh, whether the powers of the supreme court in correcting its own mistakes supreme court has power whether does it have power to correct its own mistakes yes we have seen major case which comes to all of you what is it any one case you can tell rupa yeah. pura correct rupa pura but have you read about antulesh matter as well yes. ar antulesh yes. yeah so therefore if there is a question about yes we accept you justice yeah so there is to for the ends of justice to be met and to do final the complete justice supreme court can in fact reopen cases which have been decided there are two of them which i found it very interesting is antulesh case the initial one is 1984 the second one is 1988 which is given to you in the list of cases is the second one if i am not wrong do so, abhi hai antule bhi hai antule is there antule is that 88 antule is what is given to you and of course uh, rupa ashok khurra is uh, subsequent item number 5 is antule i think correct 5 is 88 to scc 602 yeah in this what had happened in the initial stage was antule as a chief minister and there was a case against him which was not getting decided chief minister of maharashtra the case was not getting decided and therefore when the case came to the supreme court the supreme court in its judgment rendered in 1984 decided that the case should be transferred to the high court and the high court should conduct the trial and finish it expeditiously so subsequently there were certain other litigations between nayak and mr anthley both of them so it came up finally in another matter up against the certain other challenges to in between proceedings i am not uh, detailing uh, those because we are coming to the uh, end of this session so i want to quickly uh, go through two three judgments and tell you so therefore when it came finally the supreme court realized in a much later proceedings in 1988 that the earlier judgment of the supreme court by transferring the case from one from the special court uh, to the and it's a prevention of corruption court uh, uh, act the case was dealt with by special judge so therefore the transfer of case from one court to the high court from the special judge to the high court was erroneous and therefore it was the, the seven judges of this honorable court held that uh, whether the hc can be down the question whether the hc can withdraw a case from a special judge to high court it said no and the, the there is a detailed discussion of supreme court's power to review and recall the earlier judgment article 137 and article 142 has been dealt with in detail under what circumstances supreme court can pass such a directions has been uh, very well explained in fact i would say when you are reading read the judgment in rupa ashok khurra please 
couple this with this judgment as well. Because Rupa Ashokura is also given to you in item number 15. It's a five judges judgment. It's You can please note down the para numbers 49 and 51 to 53. Item 15 of the list of cases which is handed out to you. It's 2002 4 SEC 388. Is Rupa Kura. <laughs> Yes. In that, the question of there was a compromise and the lady in a matrimonial matter, she went back on her compromise and uh, thereafter whether the divorce decree or uh, whatever orders which has been passed based on that could be reopened was the question basically and after a 32 was filed and then this court was faced with the question whether there could be uh, after finality is achieved in all the litigations whether there could be any reopening of the litigation. The Supreme Court said, in fact, normally we don't reopen cases when there is a finality to the case. It is not possible. But after all the, after hearing all the advocates appearing in the matter and seeing there could be a case where there are principles of natural justice which is violated or a case where a judge who's, who is himself personally involved or a biased person who is hearing the case on those reasons, there could be extraordinary circumstances in which a case could be reopened after it being closed by the Supreme Court once for all. So therefore, a new jurisdiction of a newer kind that is called a curative jurisdiction was introduced by the Supreme Court in a very uh, beautiful manner. It said that in this jurisdiction that they, they also called out certain conditions you will have to fulfill is that they, like I said, you have to show that principle you were not heard. The party which is invoking the jurisdiction should show that they were not heard. They were either not a party or they were party but their notice was not issued and then their case was heard and substantial prejudice has caused to them. And after, uh, otherwise, a judge who was listening has been biased or that there is some indirect connection to the judge with the cause. So therefore, he ought not to have been a judge of his own cause on that principle also that or he is interested. On these principles, a case can be reopened. But there are certain uh, directives that is you have to comply with certain conditions. You should have filed. Thank you. Sir, thank you, sir. Sir, thank you, sir. No, sir, please. Sir, thank you, sir. In fact, uh, sorry. What was held in that judgment is that you have to not only aver this in a review petition which has been filed. You should have, after the case is decided by the Supreme Court, you should file a review petition raising all these grounds. And then after the review is dismissed, then after you get a, after satisfying a senior advocate and if the senior advocate feels that here is a case for filing a curative petition with the certificate of the senior advocate, you can file a curative petition. It is not that you have to just take any certificate from a senior advocate willing to do that, that you file a curative, then the matter will be dismissed with exemplary costs. So therefore, it is better before you file a curative, we have to know the case fully well before we take it up at the stage of SLP or at the stage of grid petition or whatever the jurisdiction that we have invoked and find and invoke all the grounds that is possible and then argue the case, do your homework properly before preparing and filing it and then argue this. Thereafter, it is uh, easy for you and we need not in, uh, invoke this jurisdiction unless it is absolutely necessary and we come to know of this much later in point of time. Likewise, I would like you to bunch a few more of this. There are, uh, when you are reading basic structure, also, you would have read about powers of governor, powers of speaker as well. You, th these are all our constitutional functionaries. So, when you read constitution, you would have come across 10th schedule in which the procedure as far as, if you all have the constitution, provisions for disqualification on the ground of defection. This is 10th schedule is given out 
under Article 102.2 and Article 191.2. This was brought in 1985 by the yeah, 10th, 52nd Amendment, with effect from 1985. The new, this one, earlier the 10th schedule was omitted and therefore it was brought back in 1985 because there were a lot of defections that were taking place and parties after elections they keep changing parties. So therefore came the Kyukoto Holohan which is item number 6 in your list of cases. You may have to bunch it with 22 and 59 please. That is Rameshwar Prasad and the last one Kaisham Meghichandra. So I'll just tell you broadly about what it is. I will not take much of your time. Kihoto Holohan is a case where the 10th schedule was challenged because in the 10th schedule, there were certain provisions which excluded the judicial review of the courts when a decision is taken by the speaker. Para 6 of the 10th schedule, if you see, I will read it out for you, for those of you who is not holding the book in hand, just uh, to give you some idea. Yeah, yeah, decision. If any question arises as to whether a member of a house has become subject to disqualification under this schedule, questions shall be referred for decision of the chairman or as the case may be, the speaker of the such house and his decision shall be final. Provided that where the question which has arisen is as to whether the chairman or the speaker of the house has become subject to such disqualification, the question shall be referred to for the decision of such member of the house as the house may elect in this behalf and his decision shall be final. All proceedings under paragraph, sub para 1 of this para in relation to any question as to disqualification of a member of a house under this schedule shall be deemed to be proceedings in parliament within the meaning of article 122 or as the case may be proceedings in the legislature of a state within the meaning of article 212. They are protected as if the proceedings in parliament and the legislature, state legislature are protected under these articles. So therefore, Whatever decision is rendered by the speaker or the chairman of the house in respect of a disqualification is rendered final. What happened in para 7 is bar of jurisdiction to courts. Notwithstanding anything in this constitution, no court shall have any jurisdiction in respect of any matter connected with the disqualification of a member of a house under this schedule. What it said under para 7 was it completely excluded judicial review including that of article 32, 226 and 136. So therefore in 136 we have any order that is also excluded, 226 is High Court, 32 is Supreme Court for violation of fundamental rights. So therefore this 10th schedule came up for challenging Kihoto Kolohan in that the Supreme Court, after going, after referring to all the contentions, finally, it came to the conclusion that Para 7, as far as it says that it is excluding the judicial review, is invalid because it alters the basic structure of the Constitution. So, in fact, when you read about a basic structure, probably, your question may not be directly on Keshavan and the Bharati, but a question may be some instances of violation of basic structure, how the court has dealt with it. If you know four to five cases, at least you can divide your time while mentioning these cases, you can refer to some one or two cases. Like I am supposing I am the person who is correcting the paper. I mean, for example, only I am saying, supposing I am correcting, I would know violation of basic structure you will start from Keshwan and the Bharti, start writing, it will never end. You will be writing three hours for Keshwan and the Bharti. So it's better. You will know Keshwan and the Bharti, Minerva Mills, and thereafter you will know these judgments. Like in fact, your photo. Like you can say one of the angles of yes. basic structure is this. So these are pillars. So therefore, like this speaker and the decision which a person suppose and what it said was a poor time at action cannot be permitted. What this means is there is no interlocutory, there is no urgent interim orders which will be given meaning 
you have to only there can't be some action which you can preventive action let not the speaker take a decision that kind of preventive actions we can't get or even an interim sort of an action but therefore what we can do is a final solution but the court at what point of time it can be deferred is that it says it alters the basic structure the avoiding the para 7 when it disturbs the basic structure it resort to article 368 2 which says while amending the constitution when you are taking away the articles don't say these articles don't apply to such decisions so therefore when they do not say that expressly which means it's already amending the constitution which gives every citizen the right to resort to these three provisions 136 226 and 32 if you are going to take it away by this 10th schedule by introduction of this para 7 you have to essentially amend the constitution for which there is a procedure which is to be getting ratification from all the states which is not followed so therefore on that score para 7 cannot stand as far as the other angles it said all right other paras okay because there is a speaker who is the head of the house he has to decide all this that was what Keshum said but the minority in that uh, sorry Quixote said but the minority judgment in that actually felt that nowadays there is too much of this defection happening and the speakers or the chairman of the houses are not you know impartial in that sense if they are bound to actually get carried away by a particular party's decisions so therefore it would be better that if it is referred to an individual uh, setup or a mechanism so therefore that was one small view which was taken in the minority view why i am saying that is that in fact in fact last year there was a question this may not be the similar question but what it said was why was such a resentment in this judgment was it justified yes we have Kaisham Meg Chandra subsequently, the Manipur case, that is, which is item 59 in your list of cases. This is item 59, which is Kaisham Meg Chandra Singh versus Honorable Speaker Manipur Legislative Assembly, which is 2020 to scale 329. I don't know, it is reported in SEC online though. So it says that. In that case, uh, an MLA suddenly shifted uh, his loyalty from one party to the other and the other party uh, submitted for a disqualification application before the speaker that he had made all the changes because the other party took over and they took charge and formed the government. When the application was given to the speaker for deciding whether he is, uh, whether his defection is valid and the speaker will have to rule on that. It was kept pending for a very long time and the speaker did not take any call on that application. So since the time was running and the actions were taking place, the uh, persons, in between there is a judgment called Rajendra Singh, which you all, if you are interested, you can't, you can go into that. However, the, that list, that is not in the list of cases which is given to you, though there was a mention of it in a, last year's question paper, Rajendra Singh was also asked. Why I am saying is that in this Manipur case, in that case there was no time, so therefore Supreme Court itself gave a, a direction of, uh, to the speaker to consider it. Whereas in Kaisham, what it said, it observed all this and then said, tracing the history from Kihoto Polohan, it said the non-action of the speaker in not taking a call also gives rise to an act, you know, cause of action. It is not merely the wrong action of a speaker that you can come to court, but it is also the inaction of the speaker that not taking a decision also you can come because that, you know, that entails a lot of prejudicial uh, um, situation for the candidate because there is a government form because of this defection and day to day functioning is happening. So it is a crucial call. So therefore, in this judgment, the court said, yes, there has been in fact a minority view earlier which has happened. So, it will be in the interest of things if a retired Supreme Court judge or a retired Chief Justice of a High Court judge is appointed for these kind of applications to deal with. But that's for the parliament to decide. But in the, in the uh, you know, in a passing reference, it was mentioned like that. Why? Because the speaker did not take an action. So, the whole purpose, in fact, there is no court time at action also, which is prohibited as per the Kuhoto Holohan. So, but it said, if at all it is necessary when the circumstances show 
that this can be done. In Rajendra, they distinguished it by saying there was no time. So therefore, before anything is done, the speaker in this case was given four weeks time to come back with a solution so that the next the party can take a call and this man's qualification or disqualification can be decided within the time frame. So these also come part of become part of the basic structure angle as far as the amendment goes. So this can be the powers of speaker also. Likewise, in a dissolution matters and the recommendation matters, Rameshwar Prasad is given to you powers of the governor, which is item 22, which I am not detailing because that itself will take some time, but I would like you to see. Uh, see. And uh, the other angle of uh, basic structure clubbing I would go is on this items. There are four, six of them. In fact, five of them. In fact, one question comes, you can write from everything. And item number one is that definitely Keshwananda Bharati. Two is Maneka Gandhi. As you all know that item two is Maneka Gandhi's judgment is 78 1 SEC 248 deals with the personal liberty about traveling whether it can be curtailed or not whether it amounts international travel and impounding of a passport because she was called for certain inquiries in respect of a particular commission of inquiry passport of Menaka Gandhi was impounded she came to the court under 32 saying that her fundamental rights have been affected because constitution guarantees freedom of movement and her freedom of movement has been affected. This court said freedom of movement is there, but of course you have reasonable restrictions in the constitution itself. So it's all subject to the reasonable restrictions like freedom to travel abroad cannot be classified as a fundamental right because if somebody is wanted in a particular investigation and if there is some material to show, it does, and she has to cooperate for the investigation. Therefore, it is there is nothing like a fundamental right to travel and for her. And therefore, that argument and the writ petition was dismissed ultimately. However, there were certain directives given that you cannot withhold it indefinitely without any particular period, without any reasonable cause. So, the, the attorney general who appeared in that case also made a statement and therefore it was left at that. But the judgment beautifully deals with the interplay between 14 19 and 21. So when you deal with 14, 19 and 21 interplay questions, the question may be how is the Supreme Court dealing with the situation where 14, 19 and 21? The argument was it affects her liberty under Article 21. I mean uh, for a dignity under 21. So right to live with dignity and her privacy and also this Article 14 is about arbitrariness and 19 was freedom. All these arguments were raised, but uh, they said there is nothing, no infringement of Article 21. So it was said that the impounding is all right. However, there is a statement made by the Attorney General. In that line itself, if you see item number 17 is uh, P. Ramachandra Rao. <coughs> is about a, it was a Prevention of Corruption Act case. What happened was very, very interesting. There was a judgment which said uh, that uh, if a particular trial doesn't happen with, before a particular period, two years after the charges are framed, then the accused is entitled for an acquittal. So this Prevention of Corruption Act case, in case of Ramachandra Rao, which is item number 17, which is 2002 4 SEC 578, there was a case of Prevention of Corruption Act. He was acquitted due to delay in trial. So, state filed appeal before the High Court, but the state's appeal was barred by time and it came after a prolonged period of time. It went to the High Court as against the acquittal, saying that the acquittal is bad. But the High Court, what it did, without issuing notice to the accused who has been acquitted, reversed the judgment and then it was the High Court appeal was allowed, which was challenged by Ramachandra Rao before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has issued various directions. It says that is there is no such time limit that can be fixed for a criminal trial. It depends upon various factors. Of course, speedy trial is a concomitant of this Article 21 as you know aspect, and therefore you have to try and make it possible for these accused not to face an indefinite period of trial. It is possible, but the matters were remanded to the High Court for a 
fresh consideration after giving notice to the accused as far as you know this appeal is concerned what it said was you can't fix a time frame for a particular trial to conclude and in that very you know angle this uh, the article 21 angle you can also the right against self incrimination in selvi's case you can read selvi's case which is item 26 See, Article Twenty One is expanded. Right to speedy trial is also Article Twenty One. Right to live with dignity is right to privacy. Everything is Article Twenty One. But in what manner you can exercise it, and what are the safeguards? What are the checks and balances for exercising such a right put by the Supreme Court? Can be a broader question in which you can all access to these kind of judgments. How Twenty One has been. Effectuated in various judgments by the Supreme Court. Therefore, I said Maneka Gandhi, then Ramachandra Rao. Now going to Shelby, Item 26 is the narco analysis famous case. Is that 2010 7 SEC 263? In this two angles is about Article 20 Clause 3, right against self incrimination and right against degrading treatment and right to dignity. All the three rights were dealt with. or along with right to fair trial in the use of scientific techniques in a criminal trial and a criminal investigation because today we are not stagnating in 1950s we have traveled so far the law has traveled judgments have traveled even further they have interpreted it far and wide in a manner in which it suits the moving and the changing needs of the society so therefore all these judgments when you read them like justice joseph said you don't read them like in a like a, a book a case and a question and an answer you read it making it applicable to a fact situation so that first you don't forget it second you know practically how to apply it and thirdly now we have like i said click of a button on your mobile while you are on the move in a metro or in a car or when you are traveling or you are resting wherever you are even if you open your mobile you will know the latest case law position you have live law you have bar and bench you have uh, that is there are other uh, uh, you know web uh, search engines also so like the india kanun lot of them have come up even supreme court reports have now come up with latest reports and up to date reporting there is a uh, manupatra all these can be accessible even from your mobile instrument where we are all connected with mobile uh, you know uh, uh, we have a data mobile also and we can be connected to wifi as well so i will request you all to actually keep updating yourself with the latest judgments with when you are reading all these judgments which you have the law and interpretation when you read the latest ones as well it will give you an idea as to how you can take up the present challenge like uh, justice joseph said the bolam's test is widely diluted now bolam's test was holding the field till 2019 20, 2020 also but recent two years the bolam test also has been diluted so unless we are keeping in pace with the law we will not be doing justice to our clients so while you are reading all these cases these are giving you like a basic a foundation for your practice but how you are molding it how in fact you can make a change you can also say in the present day scenario whether this is applicable what is intriguing today in fact you know in the media there is consistently supreme court has given directions as to how media will have to uh, can, can what it can be reporting what it cannot report how much of it is intrudes privacy how much of it is good now what is bad all that nevertheless we see every criminal trial every accused accused of every person accused of a criminal case is facing the media trial and the public trial in the newspaper before he faces the real trial in the court of law so like that there are certain directives what i am trying to say is that we can ourselves being responsible citizens and as lawyers we have to tell our clients also and protect the rights in fact i would say like if these kind of media trial this is an aside if these kind of media trials are taking place in fact the real culprits will go actually you know out of the law according to me all these can be cited by the real accused to show that my photos were shown for identity fraud my uh, my real rights have been taken away the media is holding a trial so the public spirit is against me the public is holding a feeling against me all this can cause delay in trial and also the real culprits can go they can escape from the clutches of the law so 
our responsibility is not only stopping with the reading of the judgments that we are getting here but we should actually make it an applicable make it applicable in our real life so that in the present day scenario also you can make it fit and update yourself with the latest law when you write a judgment use of scientific techniques for improving investigation is all fine the questions referred please refer to para 11 the conclusions are at para 262 it says it is compulsory usage of these techniques violates right against self incrimination the the results bias in a testimonial character it in fact it can't force any individuals and therefore in fact uh, it says that all these techniques adopted by the police in investigation cannot be forced on an accused in fact there are various judgments now which has come up recently by passed by other high courts also saying that even with consent such a technique if an accused says i want to undergo this test Narco analysis. I want to undergo some lie detector test. It's not permissible because it is not actually, it is violative and it doesn't help the progress of the trial is what the courts are of the view. So I am saying that this judgment of Shelby of self-incrimination and the last in the series I would say is item 44 is the euthanasia judgment. It's a standalone as well as you can go along with this. Euthanasia is item 44. I will conclude shortly. I know that you are all going wanting to go back. 18, 5 SCC 1 is common cause versus Union of India, which dealt with a, after Aruna Shenbag judgment for withholding a prolonged medical treatment, whether it was permissible. A patient for years together on certain tubes and unable to talk, unable to do anything. The family members feel, or the patient himself sometimes nowadays write out something like if I'm falling to that of a vegetable state, I do not wish to live in this condition. So that is euthanasia. So whether that amounts to, you know, whether it is permissible in law. This court said in this judgment, right to die is also under Article 20. So right to die with dignity is a part of Article 21. So when you expand the scope from Menaka Gandhi traveling to abroad, right to die. With that, if you end it, Article 21 has expanded the scope from that to this. So this is, uh, it can go, you can actually, when you read Puttasami for privacy, probably Puttasami is more applied in these kind of judgments also now. Whatever judgments which have come after the Puttasami privacy judgment, they also apply the principle of right to privacy and right to dignity of an individual in these kind of matters. So uh, with this, we have bunched up a little bit. So I thought maybe it will be of some use to you. Uh, just I want to give you some tips while writing. Please try and maintain a neat handwriting. You need not write beautifully. You can please write neatly so that the examiner who is going to correct your papers, good or bad, you are supposed to write, not type, as on today. So therefore, please write it legibly. It's not about beautiful hand. It is about legible hand. So that giving enough space for them to read and understand what you have written. You know, sometimes what happens is when the handwriting is uh, not able to be, not, uh, you know, and we are not able to decipher the handwriting, then it becomes very difficult for us to uh, evaluate and give the appropriate marks for the students. Then what to read and what to write, you should know from a judgment. When a question is asked, don't jump to the judgment. Please see what angle of the question, I mean, what area of the judgment the question is referring to. The same judgment can be applied for various aspects of the law. A judgment can decide several ratios. But if a question is asked about a particular ratio, please attend to that ratio instead of giving a broad outline about every angle that it has given. Of course, you will give. That will show that you have studied the matter. But that will actually not help you in writing, attending all the answers. Maybe this year there may be only four, uh, five questions or uh, with choices also. There may be totally 10 questions, assuming there are 10 questions with, you know, uh, five to be answered. So giving 20 marks, assuming they are giving 20 per question and all. Divide your time equally in the beginning itself. Write which is the most, you know, the question which you are most comfortable with. Finish off first and then keep checking your time and so that you can attend all the questions. Some marks will be given even assuming in the end of it you are not able to finish the entire points. At least put the bullet points of what you remember about these judgments so that you know the examiner will definitely know that you have studied the answers and you are able to do these answers. So with your kind of experience, 
I am sure you will all be able to do that. And uh, the, about this Sharad Dildichansa, in fact, we had made, or uh, my colleague uh, Sneha had made a detailed notes on Lalita Kumari and Sharad Dildichan also. I will give it to her, in fact, or any of you what there are four or five judgments which our office juniors, including Namtej Singh Johar, we had made detailed uh, notes on these judgments. It will be very easy to go through these notes to understand the judgments, which gives out the paragraphs as well. So we wanted to discuss all of them, but uh, you know, the, uh, due to time constraints, I think, and you have all been sitting here since 11 o'clock, I won't detain you. All of you know that Navtej Singh, uh, Navtej Singh Johar is about uh, the 377, how it said, you know, it is now violative and uh, they removed this provision and anyway on a consensual act, it is uh, therefore it can't be, uh, except the consensual, it is, uh, they, they, uh, they can't uh, apply this. Then Lalita Kumari is a judgment where of registering FIRs, they said what are the types of FIRs there and how a police will have to register, how they maintain a case diary, everything has been dealt with in Lalita Kumari. And the very, very important case on circumstantial evidence which gives out the five salient features of the golden principles of in a case where circumstantial evidence is involved is Sharath Birjitsan Saha that is actually 84 for SEC. They are all part of your 64 judgments. So that gives out two things that is the five golden principles of circumstantial evidence which is given out in para 153 and you can see also 134 and 145 about whether what is the additional link in that is that whether a false defense can make it an additional link to the chain of circumstances no it's not always possible that under what circumstances it can be done that is also called out in this judgment these are all very important judgments not only for the examination for any lawyer who is practicing in the supreme court because we don't confine ourselves to we can't say i'm a civil lawyer a criminal lawyer or a property lawyer or a contract lawyer or an arbitration lawyer we are supposed to take up what comes our way that's like a good lawyer of course if you're not very very you know well versed in that subject you can always hone your skills you can take guidance from persons who are very skilled or you can study further and have a discussion take an opinion and then go about it for that purpose also you know in law it's not important that you should know what is the judgment you should know where to look for it so that is most important so with this i i feel that uh, i've done some sort of uh, uh, you know uh, try to give you some inputs about how to attend the examination and I am very happy and I was privileged to be here to listen to Justice Joseph also. It was like a law class for us, taking us back to the college. So I would request you to all uh, just permit me to take leave. So I wish you all the success. Today is Advocate Day. Yes. Today I am told it is Advocate Day. So I feel that I wish you all a very great uh, uh, you know, a future in all your aspects of life. Whatever you wish to become, you should become. So. I hope the best and happens for all of you.